What is the worth of a human soul? The worth of a soul is its capacity to become as God. At times like that, just look up and leave. It's up to us to go down the road. And every time I hear his voice, I just remember what a great grandpa he was I for know, the church. Me too. <laughs> he, he, I miss him, <laughs> and I want to testify along with him that the the worth of your soul really is its capacity to become like God. Welcome back to the Worth of Souls podcast. I'm Brent, and I'm Andrea. We're very glad you're joining us for Thought Habit Number Three: Using Daily Performance for Our Spiritual Growth. This is very much a sister lesson to thought habit number two. They work together. We're going to mention thought habit number two, separating our worth from our performance quite a bit in this lesson as well. Now, last time, if you remember, we talked about how to create low feelings of self-worth and then how to create high feelings of self-worth so that we can identify those patterns as they come into our lives. And when we talked about creating high feelings of self-worth, we mentioned to hold three truths in our minds, that we were not sent to the earth to prove our worth, that we can indeed see ourselves as Christ sees us. And when we do these things, we will naturally learn how to separate our worth from our performance and begin using our performance to glorify God, which is what we're talking about in today's lesson. We really hope that you took some time working on separating your worth from your performance, because as you do that, you really start to become spiritually centered with that concept. And once it becomes rooted that you were never sent here to this earth to prove your value, then all of the other principles that we teach are going to be much easier for you to work on. A friend of ours, Heather, said this about her experience with this principle. After several stressful days of not getting enough done at work, I decided to reframe my thoughts and try focusing spiritually on my worth instead of how frustrated my boss was with me. First thing in the morning, I got up and held the thought that my Savior values me beyond any measure no matter what I do or don't do this day. I wasn't sent here to prove my worth to anyone, including my boss. Everything I get finished today, I dedicate to the Lord. After starting my day with this determination in my heart and mind, I went to work. I was amazed at the difference. I didn't feel so stressed out. I knew everything I was completing, I was doing it for the Lord. My boss still demanded more from me, but any time that happened, I said in my mind by prayer, Heavenly Father, I know my worth doesn't vary just because my boss is feeling stressed. I didn't transfer my boss's feelings over to my value. It was a miracle. I knew I was doing everything I could, and the Lord was helping me. The rest of my week, I kept spiritually focusing and at work, and by the end of the month, I completed everything that was required of me. Doing this changed my relationship with my boss. It was a much better way to live, knowing that my worth is not based on what I do. We can see from Heather's experience that the more we focus on our value as a person of worth, our whole life is uplifted and our energy completely shifts. The Lord set up the world perfectly for spiritual growth. His curriculum has worked on endless worlds before this one. All opposition is good and we can transcend it when we see, think, and feel and do as Christ. Please share any thoughts or victories that you're having while practicing these principles with us on on Facebook and Instagram. We love hearing from you. Okay, circling back to today, we get to dive more into performances and using our performances for spiritual growth. We want to remind you that performances are anything we do and think throughout our day. We defined this in the last lesson, but... 
want to make sure that we're on the same page as far as what that word means. And a huge shift happens when we come to realize that everything we do in this life can be used for spiritual growth. Before we get into the purposes of our performance, we want to break down performance a little bit more with you using what we call the performance cycle. Now, my personal professional background is with organizational behavior. I love talking about behaviors. And whenever I get to talk about it like this, with the fullness of the gospel involved, it makes me really excited. When when I was working with businesses, I couldn't include Jesus. But here, Jesus is the way, which is nine, you know, it's it's all of the way that we can even make behavior worth anything. All of the steps that we are going to describe here, they are happening in our mind and instantaneously most of the time without even realizing it. Some are even happening because of bad patterns that we have created, and therefore we might not even be conscious of them. Keep an open heart and let the Spirit teach you how to recognize how to recognize if you're getting hooked as we go through this. In the performance cycle, there are several steps. The first three steps are the same, whether we choose a temporal focus or a spiritual focus. We have some slides that you can follow if watching on YouTube, but if you're not, we'll do our best to, de- to describe it and guide you as, as you're listening. Step number one is the actual performance itself like giving a great talk in church or a negative performance like yelling at your kids. Both these are both examples of a performance, but really you can substitute any action from your day. This is step 1. Step number 2 is the creation of feelings from the performance itself, like the good feelings that happen when we give a talk and we just knocked it out of the park or when we do an anger and yell at our kids the negative feelings that come after that performance. Step number three, this is where we choose to transfer those positive or negative feelings to a temporal focus or a spiritual focus. Remember the three worlds that we talked about. We're either moving up to the spiritual world with a spiritual dimension focus or down to the temporal world. Let's talk about if we temporally focus. Let's do that first. Visually, the rest of the steps after choosing a temporal focus, they're going to be descending down because we are moving our inner world further into darkness. Step number four, we start to transfer those good feelings after giving our great talk over to our worth as a son or daughter of God. Here I want to clarify something. There is nothing wrong with feeling good about good performance. But when we transfer those good feelings that we are generating in our temples in order to determine our worth as a human being, that is the process where we get into trouble. That is the natural man way. And it causes us to become dependent on the temporal world to make make me feel of value. This also applies with the example of yelling at our kids. When we take the bad feelings that come from that performance and we choose to condemn ourselves and use that to determine our worth as a son or daughter of God. Step number five, this is where I start to seek temporal feedback and validation. For example, I make sure I'm available after sacrament meeting so people can tell me how great my talk was. I listen to see if others are talking about it. Will the Sunday school teacher bring it up, maybe, in his lesson? This is creating a dependency on the temporal world and my performance to create value within me. We will also seek feedback when we do something negative. We will look around the temporal world for reasons to condemn ourselves, like after when we yell at our children. We'll remember the last time that we yelled at them and, oh, why haven't I overcome this weakness yet? And we'll see the sink full of dishes and the stack of unpaid bills and use all of this temporal world feedback to conclude that we are of no worth. Step number six, we use the feedback that we get from the temporal world and it becomes our source of self-worth. 
Instead of looking to God to determine our worth, we've substituted that truth about God's love for us for these natural man thought habits. Okay, let's say we get lots of compliments about our talk. It feels so good. And we use those feelings from the compliments compliments, and transfer them over to the temporal world to make us feel of value. And guess who else picks that up? Satan does. So then what happens? We overhear someone in the hallway maybe say that, oh, man, it was the most boring sacrament meeting that they had ever been to in a long time. And overhearing that triggers you into thinking that, oh, my gosh, did I do something wrong? And because you're dependent on temporal feedback, you start to ask people around you, well, what do you think about how everything went? Do you think it was okay? Or ask your spouse five times how the talk went in order to build your self-worth back up by telling you that you did a great job. Satan uses this roller coaster of emotions to hook us big time. Or in the example of yelling at our kids, after I've condemned myself as a bad parent, maybe I turn to a social media addiction. And then I see a picture of the perfect Smith family who lived down the street. And I say to myself, oh man, I bet Sister Smith never yells at her kids. <laughs> Or you're talking to your sister on the phone and you mention that you messed up and she says something like, oh, yeah, I remember when I used to do that, too. I've stopped looking to God at this point to determine my worth. And instead, I'm using the temporal world around me to tell you the value that I have. Now, step seven is when we come to conclusions about ourselves based on all of those previous steps and things. In the example of our great speaker, I've concluded I am of great worth because of all the feedback, and I seek validation to make sure how great I did, even if, if I hear something oversaid about me. This is not a strong foundation, because as soon as anyone says something else that could possibly be taken the wrong way, like your bishop coming up to you and saying, oh, that sacrament meeting, it went a little bit long, don't you think? And then you're hooked again because of this comment and you are triggered because you're so far into the temporal focus that now you respond with anger or frustration or with even thoughts like, oh, I'm never going to give a talk again if the bishop isn't even going to be grateful for what I did. He didn't even say thank you. You know, thoughts like that. <laughs> or in the negative example. I've come to the conclusion that I'm a horrible parent and I keep spiraling into self-condemnation and keep coming to the same conclusion over and over again and go further into darkness. I get angry at my sister for saying what she did on the phone and how could she not understand and, and sympathize with me? Or I fall into a depression and conclude that my kids would just probably be better off without me. Now, step number eight is when everything becomes just pervasive and we keep spiraling into more and more natural man thought habits. We start to cycle back to step four and we go in this roundabout circle using another performance to determine my worth, seeking more validation, trying to get more feedback, and then more feelings arise with pride or self-condemnation. And then you get stuck in this loop in your life in general. Now remember that this performance cycle, it happens very quickly. All of these steps are what are happening within your inner world, and it's a quick turnaround with all of this. When you're stuck in a temporal focus, you feel like that you're dependent on compliments from other people to tell you how great your kids are doing in school, or you can't take rejection very well, or even a simple correction, or you're worried about someone coming over and seeing your house being a mess. If we're doing anything to get approval or praise or compare any of those things, then we know that we are in a temporal focus cycle with our performances. I, I don't know about you, but this all sounds really familiar to me. <laughs> I think I've done this before. I know, right? <laughs> oh, man. Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> Guilty. Well, welcome to humanity. <laughs> In this cycle, the main paradigm that I use is self-talk. 
Self-talk can be very destructive because it doesn't involve praying always, and it doesn't involve praising the Lord. It involves you talking to yourself about yourself or about other people, and the Spirit is not a part of that conversation. Everything that happens in this temporal focus performance cycle, you guys, it is not the Lord's way. It's the hard way to live life. Well, and I think we can all attest to that because we've all had those experiences yep. both in the negative side and on the positive side when we've when we've allowed pride to take over when something good has happened. Absolutely. It's not the way to do it. Absolutely. So it's my turn to tell you about the happy side of the performance cycle. <laughs> shake off the negative. Shake off the negative. <laughs> so let's see what happens when we choose the spiritual focus instead of the temporal focus. For this, we're actually going to go back and use the same two examples of doing the talk well and yelling at our kids. Remember in step one, we did the action. We yelled at our kids. Step two, we felt the feelings that were created within that action, and those that was feeling badly. And then in step three, we were forced to choose how we were going to use those feelings for spiritual growth. Visually, th- these next steps are moving up because we are moving – when we choose to focus spiritually, we're moving – higher and higher into light because we're remembering to separate our worth from our performance. So step number four becomes about glorifying our Heavenly Father. We can actually use this hard experience of yelling at our kids to glorify God. The first thing we must do is start by running truth through our mind and our heart like, okay, Father, I messed up. I totally did an anger with my kids. I ask thee for thy help to return to the Spirit and invite the Spirit back into my life and into our home. Father, I know thou lovest me with a perfect love, even though I didn't handle my kids right. Please forgive me. Please use the atonement of Jesus Christ to make up the difference for me. Help me to use this experience for spiritual growth. We can also look at our example of the great sacrament meeting talk. And after finishing the talk with those wonderful feelings that you have, you can say, Father, I praise thee for helping me to be an instrument in thy hands and deliver that talk. I pray it will be carried to the hearts of those that heard it through thy spirit. Then in step five, this is where we get to feel a confirmation that those prayer thoughts we placed in our temple are truth. The spirit witnesses to me that the atonement is real for me when I yell at my kids or that I have been a valiant instrument in the hands of God when I was delivering that talk. Once we receive that confirmation from the Spirit, then what do we do? What do we know? We know that we are clean and forgiven. We know that we are worthy to enter the presence of the Father. Thought habit number one. Now in step six, this is where we're going to receive feedback from the temporal world around us. But this time, we are going to use it to focus spiritually. No matter if we temporally focus or spiritually focus, we're always going to receive feedback from the temporal world. Exactly. Always. So in this scenario, our kids are upset with us because we we hollered at them. And they're walking on eggshells. And maybe even our spouse is tiptoeing around us waiting for us to blow up again. Or our spouse is upset with us for blowing up in the first place. (laughs) My spouse never gets upset when I blow up in the first place. (laughs) Yes, she does. Okay. Because I have fractured the relationship of trust, maybe my kids aren't even ready to talk to me. And that's part of the temporal world feedback. That's part of the consequences. Exactly. And if in that case, I get to keep working on getting rooted within the fact that God still loves me, even though I created this hard situation. And I can overcome this together with him. And I also get to remember that my kids are in charge of how they feel, that they get to choose how to react to this situation. And we can also look at the example of the sacrament meeting talk and know that we may hear positive and negative feedback from people about the performance of our talk. But we're not going to use either the positive or the negative feedback to feel of greater or lesser worth. We are simply going to know that the feedback we're hearing is because of what's going on inside of that person's temple. That's going to be thought habit number seven, by the way. A little plug for thought habit number seven. That's right. So if they loved the talk and felt the spirit, I know that they are running positive thought habits in their temple. And if they find fault with the talk, 
I know they're running negative thought habits through their mind and heart. Now in step seven, we are feeling grateful to be an instrument in the hands of God. With our children, we get to go through the repentance process and we get to apologize and make sure that the spirit is invited back into our relationship. We get to reinforce to them that their worth isn't based on their performance either and that God loves them with a perfect love. We get to ask for their forgiveness and let them know that we want to keep working in this life together by inviting the Spirit into our relationship. And the whole time this conversation is happening, we keep running through our mind the prayer that God's love for us is perfect. And at this point is amazing, actually, how much gratitude starts to fill our body. Once we get the Spirit back and we make amends, then our job is simply to be an instrument in God's hands. What would he have us do with this time? The Lord will show us how to mentor and communicate with our kids while we are waiting for them to forgive us. We get to keep being an instrument in his hands. And looking at the example of of the great sacrament meeting talk, when someone sees my performance and compliments me on a job well done, what is the purpose of that? So that I can stay spiritually focused and talk to my heavenly father like this, Father, You know that these compliments have nothing to do with my worth. I praise thee for helping me to be an instrument in thy hands. I am so glad that thy spirit was here to touch their hearts. You immediately start to separate the results of your talk from your performance. And and it doesn't matter if those good feelings are trying to prove my value. Because like we mentioned, Satan would immediately pick those up and someone is going to find fault with your talk. But if I have given the talk for Heavenly Father, am I okay when someone talks badly about sacrament meeting? Of course I am. If I felt the Spirit, I did all I could do. If my talk wasn't up to par with Jeffrey R. Holland, (laughs) but I felt the Spirit when I gave it, then do the heavens rejoice? Yes. And that is who we are doing this for in the first place. We didn't do it to compare or to get approval because that's the temporal focus and that creates low feelings of self-worth and a dependency upon the world. We did do it out of the love that we have for the Lord. Now, in, in step number eight, this is where the spiritual focus becomes pervasive. We cycle back to step number four. And we identify another performance that we can use to glorify God and follow these same steps. Perhaps another situation comes up with our kids again, and their performance is, again, not so great. But maybe maybe it's even the same thing that they did to cause you to do the anger in the first place. Those, those are the triggers that get you is the repeated behaviors. Exactly. But when we are spiritually focused, then we can see them for who they truly are. We consistently have a much bigger space between stimulus and response the more we are spiritually focused. And when we can handle hard situations in the future with our children the Lord's way instead of the natural man way, it is a better way to live. Yes, it is a much better way to live. (laughs) In this cycle, I'm creating a partnership with God. And I never use my performances to determine my worth in his eyes. I use my performances to glorify him. And my main paradigm in this cycle is praise and prayer instead of negative self-talk. Hopefully going through a temporal focus cycle compared to a spiritually focused cycle helps you to grasp and understand more about what happens with our performances and how we use them within those spiritual worlds or the spiritual world or the temporal world. Now we want to break down what the actual purpose of our performance really is. What is it for? We already mentioned one of the purposes of our performance. That is to glorify God. It tells us in Matthew 5:16, one of the most famous seminary scriptures ever, <laughs> Let your lights so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Does God want others to see our performances? Yes, he does. He wants our light to shine for others to see. And why? So that we can glorify God while we are shining for others to see him through us. 
It is never to glorify me. And how do we know when we are glorifying the Lord? We just hopefully went through that <laughs> with with the, the spiritual performance cycle. If you didn't get it, rewind it and listen to it again. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we can especially know because of the confirmations of the Holy Ghost. I want to share a personal experience that I have with this very concept. When I was doing things to glorify myself and when I was stuck in a temporal focus and had to get out of it. A few years ago, I had someone very important to me that was becoming extremely emotionally distant. I called her, no answer. I tried keeping in touch, no answer. There were a lot of levels in this relationship, and I felt like I was doing everything I could to keep her close. I was totally hooked into getting feedback from her and triggered by her reaction or non-reaction. I was becoming codependent on that. And after quite some time, I found myself being tossed emotionally to and fro because she wasn't glorifying me, meaning she wasn't noticing me or validating me, saying thank you for the gifts I sent, picking up the phone, texting me back. And what made it worse is that I found out that she was telling other people that we weren't that close anymore and that I actually never really did anything for her. My feelings were very, very hurt. I was completely tied up inside with all of my emotions. My heart was like wrapped in knots. And I basically gave her permission to be the temple president of my inner world. After I started identifying this very temporal cycle I was in, I went to the Lord and I told him that I wanted to glorify him with my actions. And I begged him to help me to become spiritually centered again within this specific relationship. About a week after I had made this ver a very specific matter of prayer, the spirit told me to do something for her. She recently had a baby. And a baby quilt came to my mind that I needed to make for her. I had It was a picture that came to my mind. My first reaction was to just reject this inspiration. I had already sent her gifts. She didn't care. I had already tried doing so many things for her. It hadn't worked. Why the heck would it work this time? But then the Spirit told me this. Andrea, before you did those things for her, and to make you feel better about yourself in that relationship. This time, you get to do this to glorify God. So I followed the counsel. And the whole time I worked on the quilt, I was praising the Lord. I kept saying things like, Lord, this is thy quilt. I glorify thee. While I was cutting out the squares, I said, Lord, I am cutting these quilting squares for thee. And while I was sewing, I would repeat in my mind, Lord, I am sewing this quilt for thee. This is thy quilt. And as I did this, my heart began to change toward myself in the situation and toward her. And, and the Lord gave me the gift of unhooking myself from her and becoming free with my emotions. And by the time I finished and put the quilt in a box and mailed it, I was able to do that, put it in the mail without any expectation of anything back from her. I fully expected to either hear nothing or find out from someone else that she didn't like it or something like that. And I gave the outcome of how she was going to react completely to the Lord. And then a miracle happened. She got in touch with me. She told me how stressed out she had been. She told me how beautiful the quilt was and how grateful she was that I would take the time to do that for her. And that communication, it was a miracle. I didn't expect it. And the whole time that I was talking to her on the phone, I kept reminding myself to stay in that spiritually focused cycle and say in my mind, I'm grateful, Lord, that I could be an instrument in thy hands and that it could help her. I had changed to glorify God within the relationship and let his spirit guide me. And when I did that, he helped me unhook my worth from her reactions to me. 
the Lord softened my heart and he softened hers. And just like Nephi on that ship, when I chose to glorify him and make that quilt for him, for God, then miracles occurred in my life, both for myself and for our relationship going forward. Let's look at another purpose for our performance, and that is so that we can become like our Savior. In Matthew 5, 48, it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. In Greek, perfect means complete, finished, or fully developed. So let me read that again. Be ye therefore complete, finished, fully developed, even as your Father which is in heaven is complete, finished, and fully developed. Christ is who makes us complete. He is the one who helps us to be finished and fully developed. It is all because of him and Heavenly Father's perfect plan that help us. An important point we do want to touch on is the principle of sanctification. Among some Latter-day Saints, there is more and more talk about striving for sanctification, or other names for it include a calling and election made sure, or having a second comforter experience, or being perfect. Now, this is honestly, it's a really exciting topic. It is topic. a very exciting topic. Sanctification is a great topic. <laughs> But we're not going to be covering it in these lessons. The reason why is because we have also seen that many of these same members in their zeal for striving for sanctification, a lot of times pass over the very important first step. And that is the process of justification that we went into detail about in thought habit number one. In that zeal for sanctification, when an experience isn't happening or the path doesn't include what they assumed it would, or they are working so hard and it doesn't produce the fruit they want, then they start to do an overwhelm or a frustration and they lose the spirit. If you have experienced this as well, we encourage you, remember in the path to becoming perfect, even as Christ is perfect, there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves. If you are striving to become perfect and doing, 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 then overwhelm is going to happen, and that is going to cause you to lose the Spirit. We will never be capable of sanctification without Christ. And along that path, He does remind us that we can feel the Holy Ghost. Then we are on the right road. And then Christ makes us perfect within Him and His atonement. Just like the Scripture says, we've read it before, it's just so good. He that receiveth of God, let him account it of God, and let him rejoice that he is accounted of God worthy to receive. That's in DNC 50. We're also told, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15. Now, some people misinterpret this scripture and think that it's telling them that God's love is conditional, that if I keep the commandments, then God will love me, and that if I don't, he won't love me anymore. That is not what this scripture is saying. What is it saying? What is the purpose of our performance when we are keeping his commandments? We keep his commandments not so he will love us more, but so we can feel and abide in his love. That is what the scripture is telling us. God is telling us when we keep his commandments, we will be in the light. And when we don't keep his commandments, we go into darkness. God tells me that when I choose to go into darkness, he still loves me. I just won't be able to feel it because I've put up a barrier to that light. The more I walk in the light, the more I can see, think, feel, and do as the Savior would do. And now... In that case, using my performance to become like Jesus Christ. Another purpose for our performance is to qualify for the grace of Christ. In Ephesians 2, Paul tells us that the Lord is rich in mercy and that he loves us even when we are dead in sin. He goes on to say that by grace we are saved or our works do not save us. Our performance does not save us. It is the grace of Christ that saves us. Why are our, why are our works essential yeah. then? Why do we even do our performances what do, then? What am I going to church for? <laughs> we, are, we are doing those performances to qualify for the grace of Christ. 
So tell me, how can you tell if you are qualifying for the grace of Christ? By the Spirit. By the Spirit. In your everyday life, when you feel the Spirit, it means you are qualifying for the grace of Christ. You're pronounced clean and forgiven. Elder Uchtdorf addressed this in a beautiful talk that he gave called The Gift of Grace. He said this, Salvation cannot be bought with a currency of obedience. It is purchased by the blood of the Son of God. Thinking that we can trade our good works for salvation is like buying a plane ticket and then supposing we own the airline. Or thinking that after paying rent for our home, we now hold title to the entire planet Earth. Grace is a gift of God, and our desire to be obedient to each of God's commandments is the reaching out of our mortal hands to receive this sacred gift from our Heavenly Father. Later on in the talk, he tells us that he's concerned that we misinterpret Nephi's words, quote, after all we can do, that we confuse the word after with the word because. And of course, that is, that's inaccurate. That's not true. He then says, quote, I am certain Nephi knew that the Savior's grace allows and enables us to overcome sin. This is why Nephi labored so diligently to persuade his children and brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. Yes, his talk is on the list of assignments for this lesson. It's so good. That talk is beautiful. Another purpose of performance is to qualify for the riches of eternity. In D&C 78, it tells us that we are little children and we can't comprehend what the Lord has in mind for us. And no matter how much I feel and try to comprehend the blessings God has in mind for me, that there's no way that we can really ever comprehend it. It then tells us in verse 18 that we can't bear all things now. Is that true? Well, yes, we can't. We can't bear all things right now. And then we're told to be of good cheer. Why would I be of good cheer if I'm not able to bear all things? He tells us, for I will lead you along. He gets to lead us along. And when we're spiritually centered, we're very aware of how he leads us. Thank heavens Jesus is our Savior, and he can bear all things and teach us along the way. DNC then goes on to tell us, tell us that the kingdom is yours. And isn't that a further confirmation of the truth that when we feel the Holy Ghost, we're clean and forgiven? We've already got it. The blessings are ours and the riches of eternity are ours when we stay on the covenant path. It's already done. All that's asked of us is that remain that we remain spiritually centered as covenant keepers in the gospel. Elder Uchtdorf, in that same talk that we talked about above, said this about that. Dear brothers and sisters, living the gospel faithful and faithfully is not a burden. It is a joyful rehearsal, a preparation for inheriting the grand glory of the eternities. Just like Elder Uchtdorf said, as we work on becoming one with Christ, then we are qualifying for the riches of eternity. So the recap, what are the purposes of our performance? To glorify God to become like our Savior, to qualify for grace and for the riches of eternity, and to build the kingdom of God. It is never to develop feelings of self-worth. Never. Never. In 2 Nephi 32, Nephi reminds us that we must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place ye shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be fair for the welfare of thy soul. We don't have to change our daily activities. What we get to change is who we are doing those activities for. Yeah. Can I clean the toilet and do it to glorify God? Can I walk the dog and use it to become like my Savior? Can I go around my house and turn off every single light and make it a spiritual growth experience? <laughs> Just as a side note, science has proven that a dad spends 67% of his time in his home turning off lights <laughs> that he himself did not turn on. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, well, science also tells us that 82% of statistics are made up on the fly. <laughs> All right, touche. <laughs> God asks us to serve him with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength. 
Does he care about whether or not we change diapers for him? Yes, he does. He cares. The daily activities can be for our spiritual growth. You don't have to put anything else on your to-do list because you're already doing everything you need to do to become spiritually focused. You just need to recognize whether you are doing that list for the Lord or for yourself or for others. That's it. It's really that simple. God is so abundant. When we plant this seed, watch how it will grow. When we do these daily activities to glorify God, he promises that he will magnify our efforts and that the things of this earth shall be added unto us even an hundredfold, yea, more. When we are choosing to do all of our performances for the Lord, then it becomes a lot easier to enjoy the day. The more I perform out of the love I have for Heavenly Father, the greater the separation of worth from my performance and the greater level of hope I feel every day. We have quoted this before, but it's just too good not to put in here twice. President Nelson emphasized being able to enjoy each day in this way. Saints can be happy under every circumstance. We can feel joy even while having a bad day, a bad week, or even a bad year. My dear brothers and sisters, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 14, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, dot, 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 we're going to pause. It is so much a part of our everyday vernacular to ask, how's your day going? And often when somebody asks us how we are doing, we say different things in response like, oh, today's a great day, or oh, it's an okay day. Or, no, it's actually really not that great today. Or, I'm feeling so stressed out. Or, I hate the rain and it sucks. (laughs) These reactions come from a temporal focus when we allow the day to determine how we are doing within our temples. When every day is consistent, it's not because our temporal world is consistent. It's because we know we're getting more consistent in being spiritually centered about those things and the ups and downs of life we use for spiritual focus. Paul goes on. He says, He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. When we're using the day for spiritual growth, then it is always a great day. When we don't focus spiritually, then we don't regard the day to the Lord. And sometimes we think that we're here just to endure to the end. But you guys, enduring to the end, it's just all about progression. It's not about surviving and being miserable in that survival. (laughs) Except when it's snowing, then it's all about survival. (laughs) What about when we are steeped in sin? Sometimes so much that we don't feel like we are even worthy to pray. This is an important thing to bring up. The fact is that sin is performance. And often what happens is someone is caught up in sin, like adultery or stealing or an addiction or lying, and Satan very effectively convinces them to attach their worth to that performance. A big reason why is because of the darkness that prevails in sin. That's why Satan has his hooks in there. Exactly. And through sin, we have gone into that darkness and repeated that that temporal performance cycle that we talked about and gone deeper and deeper into that self-condemnation. In this place, we don't feel like talking to a perfect Heavenly Father. In Doctrine and Covenants 32, we learn that it is the evil spirit that convinces men not to pray. And the Book of Mormon backs that up. If someone you know is caught up in sin and you are seeing this cycle in our lives, or if it's happening in your own, then the first step is to unhook your worth from your performance. Remember that God loves you perfectly. We can't feel his love in the darkness, but it is there nevertheless. When we can separate our worth from our performance, all of a sudden we realize that we can pray again. And it's exactly what God wants us to do. He really does want to hear from us always. Yeah, and think about those of you who have been to the temple, and it tells us this in the Old Testament as well. Satan is the one that tells us to hide. 
God is the one that tells us to come out. When we start talking to Heavenly Father, guess what happens? Our performance increases because we start to seek the light again. There are always consequences for our choices, especially when it comes to deep sin. But we can handle those consequences with the Lord's help because we've turned back to him in prayer. Isn't isn't this the way we feel towards our own kids? When one of them makes a mistake, do you scold them and tell them to go away and don't come back until you figured out how to fix that by yourself? Of course not. We tell them, I, I love you, son. And how can I help you repair what you have damaged? Because the mistake doesn't change the way we love our children, and it doesn't change the way God feels about us. That's right. In the end of our lives, all of us will stand before the Lord, and our book of life is going to be opened. It tells us that in Revelation. Bruce R. McConkie gave a really juicy quote about this. (laughs) He said this, quote, In a real though figurative sense, the book of life is the record of the acts of men as such record is written in their own bodies. It is the record engraven on the very bones, sinews, and flesh of the moral body, mortal body. That is, every thought, word, and deed has an effect on the human body. All of these leave their marks. Marks which can be read by him who is eternal as easily as the words in a book can be read. When the book of life is opened in the day of judgment, men's bodies will show what law they have lived. The great judge will then read the record of the book of their lives. The account of their obedience or disobedience will be written in their bodies. Wow. When when I first read that quote, I read it through several times to digest that. Uh, what I get from that quote is this. When we're spiritually focused, God can read that in our bodies just like the words of a book. Something else it tells us is that being spiritually focused and doing all the little actions we do to glorify the Lord does make a difference. Every thought, word, and deed has an effect on our bodies. It's just amazing to me. With all of this lesson in mind, let's now look at the challenge. Last time, you got to work on separating your worth from your performance. This time, you get to focus on doing your performance out of the love you feel for the Lord. First, awake and arouse your faculties to see as Christ sees. On our website, we have provided a list of scriptures and talks to use as you make time for holiness, and they all review the idea of the purpose of our performance every day. We also recommend that you post reminders around your home to do everything you're already doing for the Lord. Like above the sink, put a little sticky note that says, remember to do the dishes for the Lord, to glorify the Lord. On your fridge, put on there, remember, glorify the Lord when you cook your meals today. We are inviting you to specifically plant that seed in your heart, that the purposes of your daily performance make that difference in your life. Second is to exercise a particle of faith, to think as Christ thinks. Hold that truth in your mind that it matters to do those daily performances for the Lord and set a timer. And when it goes off, Pray and do that 10, 15 times a day, praying about vacuuming for the Lord and talking to your boss for the Lord or driving home in traffic for the Lord or in the snow. <laughs> we, have, we have also provided a sample prayer with prayer and praise phrases that you can use on our website. Third is a desire to believe and let this desire work in you to feel as Christ feels you get to receive a confirmation about the truthfulness of the purposes of performance, that your performance is to glorify God, become like Christ, qualify for grace and the riches of eternity. Your performance is not to determine your worth. Keep getting, keep getting that concept rooted within your temple, within your inner world. As you get more and more confirmations from the Spirit, this doctrine will become much more rooted. As Alma says, your faith will be dormant and you will have a perfect knowledge. 
And you will notice that just as Paul says, you will start to regard the day to the Lord. And every day is going to be a great day. You will feel the swelling motions of the spirit, the enlarging of your soul and enlightening of your mind. And so many beautiful ways it will become delicious to you to do things for God. It's all about Alma's process of change to feel all these things. There is also a guided meditation as a tool that you can use to learn more about understanding the purpose of your performance. Fourth is to give a place for the portion of my word and do as Christ would do. Now is our chance to to focus on doing all of those things, the search, pondering, and praying for the love that we have for Heavenly Father. And because we will do that for Him, His Spirit will continue to strive with us. And remember, guys, Satan is going to attack you like crazy. While you practice to apply what we have talked about today, be aware that his fiery darts are going to come. So when you do just one normal activity, driving to work in traffic or making lunch or getting your kids ready for school, just do one thing. That's making progress. Now, Satan's not going to stop attacking you, but what he's going to do is to try to convince you to slip back into your daily routine without thinking about doing these things for the Lord. So just do one thing for the Lord. One normal everyday activity to glorify God. And the next day, do another one. And then the next day, do another one. It does work. It makes a difference. You can do it. (laughs) Yes, you can do it. It really does make a huge difference. Please take the next few days to put into practice what we've talked about. The next lesson is thought habit number four, viewing everything in this world as a stewardship. And until then, remember that the worth of your soul is great in the sight of God. The Worth of Souls podcast is not an official publication of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you have any questions about the doctrines discussed here, please visit the church's official website for clarification.